Okay, as the chair of the examination committee, I want to um, first of all do attendance roll call. So um, I'm here. Dr. Lay? Here. Dawson? Here. Forsyth? Here. Lai? Mackenzie's not here, and Morrow. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the, our first agenda item is the approval of the May 14, 2015 exam committee meeting minutes. Any, any comments from our board members, from our committee, committee members? I have a question for council. I was not on the examination committee last time, so I should abstain from my vote to approve the minutes. Did you sit in the audience? I'm sorry? Did you sit in the audience um, while the committee yes, met I did. in 2015? Yeah. yeah. Can you recollect <clears throat> um, what actually took place by looking at the minutes? Yes. If you, oh, you can? Yes. Well, sure, you can vote. Okay, thank you. Sarah, did Sorry, you just point of clarification. The examination committee meeting minutes that are in the board meeting packet are from May of 2015, at which time I believe, Dr. Lay, you were um, on the committee as you were uh, noted as a member present for the committee on the meeting minutes. Oh, it was two years ago. It was, yes. <laughs> two years ago is the last time the exam committee met. <clears throat> Another person in denial. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll move to adopt. Okay. Okay, so let me roll call. Wu, I public comment. I'm sorry. Public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Pub any public comment about those about the minutes from two years ago? <laughs> Seeing none. Okay. I'll I'll go ahead and call um, the voting roll call. So Wu is is I Lay. Dawson? Um, was not present. Okay. So you abstain? So, so you're abstaining? You're abstaining. I'm staying. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Forsyth? Yes. Lai? Yes. Mer Meredith isn't here. And Morrow? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to go to the next agenda item, number three, and it's the update on the portfolio pathway to licensure. Um, I have uh, sat in on the UOP UCSF um, portfolio committee. I was I had an opportunity to be invited to that, and there were some agenda items, or there were some items that were brought up by the schools in regards to um, the technicality of the exam. And so I wanted to include that um, here today for our exam committee members, and and just let you hear what the questions are and to get some feedback from you. So uh, the first one, which was from UCSF, concerned the case selection from the ODTP exam. And uh, their question concerned uh, periodontics, which was listed as one of the six disciplines that was selected for the exam. And their, their, their comment was the board verbally told us that the ODTP patients did not have to have moderate periodontitis and we would like written clarification on this point. So um, I'm just gonna open that up to any of the exam committee members. Dr. Morrow? <clears throat> my, uh, my understanding of that issue is that the uh, oral diagnosis and treatment planning competency examination to qualify the patient to qualify the student or the applicant for that competency examination must have treatment need in at least three of the six identified treatment needs available. Periodontics is one of those, okay? Now, for, this is case selection. This is patient selection for the examination to be conducted. That patient does not have to have periodontal disease, but if periodontal disease is chosen as one of the three required disciplines, then periodontal disease must be at least moderate, which would be identified by at least five millimeter pocket depths. So 
Out of those six disciplines, only three of them need to be involved in the patient's treatment need. If one of those, if the student or the applicant chooses periodontal disease as one of those three, then it specifies that the disease must be at a certain level. Now, it doesn't have to be periodontal disease. It could be any of the other three or four or five, but it, it's a minimum of three. But if perio is one, then it must be at least five millimeter pocket depths. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. And go ahead. I'm concerned about um, <clears throat> the dentist um, being able or, you know, having this field of uh, dentistry included in the exam in, I mean, or, or in the teaching experience, that um, they not, necessar not, not necessarily have this um, form of education given that a dental hygienist cannot tr uh, treat a patient who has uh, periodontal disease or who has not been diagnosed as di dental hygiene, uh, uh, periodontal disease. Uh, how do I say this? <laughs> if the dentist is not um, educated on class five perio treatment, but yet their um, person that they're supervising has to be uh, at a certain level of periodontal disease. Um, it sort of leads the dental hygienist at a disadvantage when the person that they're working with cannot necessarily treat that particular level of disease. You know what I'm saying? Am I making myself clear? So are you saying that if they elect not to include that as part of the exam that you're questioning whether they should be able to supervise the hygienist? Exactly. Okay. I, do you, Dr. Murray, would you like to comment? Sure, just because that was not a selection of the examination itself does not mean that that student is graduating from dental school without the abilities to diagnose and supervise treatment of disease beyond what that examination calls for. But we have no proof or record of, of the dentist being um, qualified well, to treat <clears throat> these patients when they have not necessarily passed that ex section of the... We, ha we have additional components of the licensing examination process and the licensure issue process and also uh, requirements for graduation from the School of Dentistry that is CODA approved. So there could not be a single examination that will test everything that that student graduates with the knowledge and skills in. That would be impossible to do. Um, to answer Katie, I think my understanding, or at least my knowledge, that our exam for licensure is designed to establish the minimum competency. So that's the reason why we only test certain procedures. We're not testing everything. Um, so yeah, so basically the licensure exam is to establish the minimum competency of the, of the licensees. And I think it would probably go the same for the general hygiene examination. Does, does that help clarify, Katie? It, it helps, but I wanted to just make my concern known. Mm -hmm. And um, for the record, I'm just concerned about um, someone who may not necessarily pass this, per, this section of the exam being uh, in a position of supervising a person that has had this level of training. It's, you know, uh, it, um, it's, it's a personal belief of mine, and I would, I'm sure we're gonna, gonna go ahead. Um, 
with your discussion or with our discussion, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, my concern was voiced. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And are there any other comments concerning this aspect that, we're, that we were just talking about? May I just say one more thing that I think will help clarify? This is just a competency within the organized diagnosis and treatment planning aspect. There is a perio component to this in which the candidates are tested, so it's not as if they were going un, untested at all in perio. This is just one section of the ODTP portion of the portfolio Thank where you. they have a choice. Does that, does that help? Because I know it's a little confusing. It's quite all right. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> this, the second item uh, within this discussion of portfolio was the grading for the endo exam. We had a question from uh, UCSF in which um, they asked that uh, a second examiner only be included in the case of a, of a failing grade, and that's not possible. We, we have required within the portfolio that two examiners be uh, present for uh, this aspect or any aspect of the exam. So um, if you would like to speak more to that, Dr. Morrow, since you're our as an endodontist here, yes, you can. Our, our psychometric mm -hmm. consultants uh, mm -hmm. designed the portfolio examination process for validity and reliability. And one of the aspects of the examination that is required for appropriate validity and reliability is that each scoring factor on the examinations must be scored independently by two separate examiners. Limiting that to only one for any particular item of scoring is, is not being consistent with the required validity and reliability of the examination. So therefore, having a single grader for any portion of the exam or for any exam invalidates the examination process. Thank you for the clarification. Any, any other comments? I have about? one comment. Yes. When I was at uh, UCSF on that meeting, mm -hmm. one of the questions was if a root canal had been started in a, as, as part of an emergency, mm -hmm. would that candidate be able to use that patient part of their portfolio and, and their reason for that question was they weren't having, they weren't getting enough um, mm -hmm. practice or, or didn't have enough patients that mm -hmm. required. That's where this question came from. Yeah, and so. So, so in answer specifically to that, they are allowed to use that uh, patient later in the portfolio exam, even though the emergency treatment has been rendered, but they need two examiners oh, for that part. And right. that was where I think the, the hiccup was mm -hmm. um, in, in the understanding of that. Does it? Let me, let me see if I can help. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the, the starting point for the, for the portfolio competency, endodontic competency examination would, in this situation would be that the patient history that would be recorded as part of the examination and diagnosis process is that, let's say, a pulpectomy had been done previously two weeks before in the emergency clinic, okay, at the school. Now, the student who is wanting to use this patient as a portfolio exam, the starting point then would be what the patient is presenting at that time. So pulpal diagnosis in this situation would be pulpless if a pulpectomy had been performed, okay? So that's an accurate diagnosis at the beginning point of the competency exam. The same as a practicing dentist might have a patient come in that had a root canal treatment started by another dentist and is now presenting for treatment. That's, that's the beginning point of the examination from a standpoint of history, examination, diagnosis, and treatment planning. Is that, is that, is that help? Even though the patient had been treated previously for pain, and a pulpectomy was done, at that point, the diagnosis then would be pulpless if a pulpectomy had been done. I, I, I'm 
this feeling where if something had been started by someone else, how can that be a, I mean, is it, do two instructors have to say, okay, that, uh, this root canal can be part of the portfolio? I mean, are, who, just say, let's just say when this person went into an uh, emergency, and it was all, all basically completed. And the person fluted and did everything. And so the next candidate would say, oh, I want this as part of my portfolio. And he, didn't, he doesn't really have to do anything with that, which would not show that he was capable of doing it. It was already done for him. So you're concerned about we, the competency after someone has rendered emergency yes. treatment? Yes. <clears throat> That's my concern. Even though there are, there's a lack of patients to work on, how do we safeguard against that? Well, you have two examiners that would have to um, be in agreement on that as a safeguard of the process. So they would take a look at it prior. And also there, there was a, there was also the um, correct diagnosis being made after the emergency treatment was rendered. So in other words, like Dr. Morrow said, it would be pulpless if the, if the mm -hmm. you know, person that takes on right. the portfolio says something different, then it's a critical error. Okay. Well, Dr. Lai, I think I could, I could agree with you if, if, again, that depends on what was done at that initial appointment as to whether or not that case would be acceptable for the portfolio. Say, for instance, if at the emergency treatment uh, to relieve pain, not, not only a pulpectomy was done, but complete cleaning and shaping and the whole business. That obviously is a clinical judgment at the time that the two examiners are gonna to have to say, no, you went beyond just relieving the patient's pain. Uh, so that would be, no, we'd reject that. So th those are things that have to, have to t rely on clinical judgment at the time of the examiners. And it's, you couldn't possibly put all of that kind of stuff in writing. So it's a clinical judgment issue, and part of that is calibration on the part of the examiners for the endodontic competency examination, portfolio competency exam, calibration. What are we going to do in these situations? And, and that's a case-by-case -case type of a situation. To try to put down in writing everything that's going to happen would be uh, an exercise in futility and frustration. So as I go around to the different schools, these, these are the questions that are brought up. So um, we're trying to answer them um, as best as we can individually and also give them um, some latitude of interpretation within the, statu uh, within the regulations. So you know, there will be things as we go along that we have to smooth and, and redefine or clarify. So but, do we have a staff person as the calibration expert to go to these schools? Not at this time. Would you like to do that? No, I'm kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Okay. And, and then the last uh, request was um, the schools are feeling that the paperwork is extremely uh, cumbersome and overwhelming, and they made suggestions for how they would like to put this to be a paperless kind of, a, of an issue. And at this time, <clears throat> at this point in time, we do require them to fill out the competency exam sheets that we that the dental board has issued, and it could be something that we might uh, think about and, and do in the future, but at this point, uh, we would change that in regs, if I'm correct, Karen, and that would be a future consideration, but at this time, no. Okay. Um, um, I'd say we'll report back at a future meeting more specifically, but uh, I know that Loma Linda and Western have actually taken our forms and put it into an electro electronic format. So within the school, they're using electronic format. Mm -hmm. The question will be whether the board needs to maintain paper copies. And so that's what we'll look forward, we'll look into. Mm -hmm. Even if the school, even if the candidates submitted an electronic copy, we would just need to determine um, whether or not the board would print out 
essentially that information, keep it part of the file, or whether we can also keep electronic copies. So I think that mm -hmm. at this point, um, we can probably encourage the schools, should they choose to do so, to use exactly our same forms. If they want to make it electronic, uh, they can go ahead and do that. But they would also, upon audit, need to be producing in hard copy what the auditors will be looking at. So this is something that we can agendize for a future meeting in the exam committee, uh, outlining the specifics of that. that. That's great, because I think that's where, where the questions are coming from. My, it's my understanding at this point in time is that the board requires that the portfolio documentation needs to be submitted to the board in paper form, not electronic. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So, so if, and, and I agree with you, some, some of the schools have converted the board's assessment forms into an electronic version so that it can be done, you know, paperless. But that electronic version can then be printed and sent to the board. Right. At the present time, that's what needs to be done. At some time in the future, we might make it, and hopefully we would make it possible to submit that electronically, uh, maybe even as an attachment on an email or something of that, ty of that type. But yes. it is possible for at least the, uh, I think the, the major electronic record uh, system that the schools in California use to make, the, to create that form, in a, those forms in electronic format and then print them off to send into the board. Um, so I'm gonna go on and discuss um, <clears throat> agenda item number three um, further in terms of the there were 35 portfolio applications for 2015-2016 school year. UCSF submitted 12, UOP submitted 19, and USC submitted three, and UCLA submitted one. So to date, the board has issued 42 dental licenses via the portfolio exam pathway. Um, we have not received applications for the 2016-2017 school year, however, um, the board staff has issued 10 candidate identification numbers to Loma Linda, 115 to UCSF, 14 to UOP, and three to USC. So that's just an update there. So why, would, why is there so, so many applicant ID numbers generated for UCSF? I, I'm not sure why that is. And why, you know, there, because there's they some, were, they were more, I mean, when we did the visit, they were more leery of, of this exam than anybody, but mm -hmm. yet, is that their whole class? Mm -hmm. It's the whole class. So. Initially, when we started this process, UCSF plan and hope was that the whole class would go down this route. I think once they got into it, they saw that it presented more challenges than they had anticipated. So um, we've encouraged people to, to request candidate ID numbers. Those ID numbers will be used if the candidate goes on either by way of portfolio or uh, REB or something oh, else okay. because that candidate number will be used because they have to take the law and ethics exam. So, uh, yes, it's surprising that they submitted all the names this time around mm -hmm. after the conversation that we had with them, but they did. Okay, uh, moving to, ag any other questions? <clears throat> moving to agenda item number four. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm always forgetting the public comment. Does the public have any comment they'd like to make about this? Mary McCain with CDA. I just wanted a point of clarification. The answers to the questions from the UOP and UCSF meeting, were those already answered to those schools or will they be provided in writing? They will, um, be, in provi the they will be provided in writing. They were not answered at the time. Okay. I just took the notes and All said right. I will bring it up at the meeting. 
Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Any other comments? Just for future clarification, um, we will actually agendize specific comments like these questions that came forward in future meetings so that we can have background information. Um, I think that there was some, some comments made or some questions. I think the, the appropriate place for these questions to be answered is the exam committee. We'll just make sure to get the questions out sooner. Okay, moving on to agenda item number four, the Western Regional Exam Board, the REB report. Dr. Lay? Sure. Um, so on behalf of the Dental Board of California, I attended the Dental Examination Review Board uh, meeting um, of REB on January 13, uh, 2017. And um, the reports were given at that meeting uh, was, um, are as follows. Um, in 2016, there were 2,216 candidates that took the RAP exam. 640 were from California. So again, California was the most um, out of all the states um, accepting RAP. The, um, 90% of the candidates who took the REP exam passed in 2016, so 2% failed. On the clinical treatment plan uh, written exam, 99% um, passed. The area where most candidates had problems with um, was pharmacology. So the, stu the candidates seemed to um, have um, a problem of, of overdosing uh, medications and uh, anesthetics. So that was very interesting. Um, provisional acceptance for restorative procedures is being done at 74% of the exam sites. Um, what that means is that the candidates can actually submit the x-rays in advance and the examiners will review the exams online and approve the patients prior to the exam. By doing the provisional acceptance, um, REP has found um, that the check-in time at the exam sites reduced by 25 minutes on the average. So they will continue to do that. Uh, they only started this last year. Um, they also found that um, the number of candidates who um, wanted to do amalgam restorations went down from 31% to 2%. So what that means is that there is that trend um, of not many candidates are doing amalgam restorations. So they are now allowing candidates to do two um, composite restorations on the exam instead of an amalgam and um, a composite. Um, there are also... Um, um, allowing um, in the provisional acceptance, if a candidate had the lesion rejected online, the candidates have the permission um, or the opportunity to resubmit the same tooth at the exam site. However, if they did that and the lesion got rejected again, they will be subject to a penalty. One question, so in provisional acceptance, if it's rejected there, you cannot resubmit? Yes, you can. You can, okay. Yes. So okay. that's what they're doing right now. Okay. They will allow, because what they found was that the provisional acceptance online, the acceptance rate is actually a lot lower mm -hmm. than on-site. Therefore, they're allowing, they're giving the second chance um, to the candidates. But as I said, if that same lesion got rejected again, then they will get penalized for it. Um, what's right now, if they just submit somebody a new lesion and get rejected, they don't get penalized for it. Is that a point penalty or a time penalty? I'm sorry? Is that a point penalty or a time penalty in terms of the it's a second point. rejection? It's okay. a point penalty. Okay, thank you. Um, and let's see. Um, several states are actually considering, um, you know, accepting all regional exams 
including OSCE, which is the Canadian exam. Um, Washington and Colorado are um, accepting all, including OSCE. And of course, Colorado is one of the states that's also you know, accepting portfolio at this time. So um, um, there, was, there was still ne negative feedback um, at this meeting about, um, you know, on the portfolio. Um, you know, there was um, one doctor from CODA that was there, and he insisted that there was a portfolio was still not a valid exam because there was lack of independent party. Um, lack of indi independent party? Like, like you're an examiner, so anyway. Um, so he, he, did tell, he did tell me that. Um, REP is also considering um, three things. Number one is crown and bridge on the exam because some of the states um, are requiring the um, indirect restorations as part of the licensure. So I think REP is doing this to attract some of those states. So they are considering, they're not doing it yet, but they are considering you know, allowing crowns and bridges on the exam. They're also considering using plastic endo tooth for the endo section um, that has not been decided. And they're also considering immediate, allowing immediate retake of the restorative portion. So what that means is if someone failed the restorative portion they could actually submit another patient or another lesion and retake that restorative portion immediately. Um, and if they passed, then they would be granted a license. They have been doing this for the dental hygiene exam already. Um, so they are considering doing that for the dental exam. Um, so those are the three things that they are considering, the crown and bridge, the plastic endo tooth, and also the immediate retake of restorative. Um, and it was really interesting sitting there listening to the other member states of REP, um, you know, the same things that they are considering for legislation in their states are basically the same things that we are considering in our states. Sedation anesthesia was probably one of the biggest things that's going on right now in some other states, so we're not alone. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Any, any other comments? No? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Morrow? Question. Uh, <clears throat> in REB, uh, considering an indirect uh, component of the, uh, of the examination, yes. was that on a, on a simulated typodont or on a patient? Um, they were talking about both, like, you know, on patient and also on typodont. Um, so it was a discussion that they started. Um, they haven't really made any decision on that at this time. I just want to comment that um, when the conversation gets started again, if you can bring the mics a little closer. For the first time, we can hear Dr. Lay, but we couldn't really hear Dr. Lai, Dr. Morrow, Dr. Wu. So maybe pull your mics a little closer. Thank you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I just had to get really close. <laughs> um, agenda number five, uh, Karen Fisher did talk about it. It's about the Assembly Bill 2331, and it's related to the acceptance of um, ADEX for dental licensure in California. Does, does anybody want me to review that again? She went through it in, in great detail, but does anyone need a, a review of it? Okay, not seeing any takers. So, um, any public comment? Okay, I think this ends the examination committee. Or wait. Oh. Thank you, Karen. Um, any public comments on items that are not on the agenda? Okay, not seeing or hearing any. Um, <clears throat> um, any future agenda items that anybody would like to bring up at this time for, for our next meetings? Any committee member comments on the items not on the agenda? 
Okay, thank you, everybody. We are adjourned. Next up is uh, License and Certification and Permits Committee. I think we're going to try to finish one more committee uh, before we take the lunch break. Then we'll come back after lunch and do two more committees before we then adjourn or recess for the day and the board will go into closed session. So I'm going to call the uh, meeting for the license, licensing, certification, and permits committee to come to order. So I'm going to take the roll call first. <coughs> Ross Lai, here. Judith Forsyth. Here. Yvette chappelle Ingram. Aye. Steve Morrow. Here. Deborah Wu. Here. Okay. All in attendance. So first on the agenda, we're going to approve the February 26, 2015 uh, Licensing Certification Permits Committee meeting minutes. So it's been that long since then? It's a long time. Okay, so uh, Sarah's going to take the... If, if somebody wants to approve the motion and second it, no motion. So that, everybody did their homework, so we all read it, right? Okay, good. So I'll go ahead and call the roll. Dr. Lai? Yes. Judith Forsythe? Yes. Yvette Chappelle Ingram? Yes. Dr. Morrow? Yes. Dr. Wu? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, third thing. Third thing on the agenda is review dental licensure and permit statistics. And I think Sarah has that, right? Yes. Uh, so Sarah Wallace, Assistant Executive Officer for the Board. Uh, in the, the Board meeting packets, we've included a review of the dental licensure and permit statistics. They are in the same format that you saw the dental assisting statistics during the joint meeting. Again, I would like to disclose that I don't uh, know that there's a hundred, I can't verify 100% accuracy for these statistics due to the reporting program, uh, but we are working on verifying uh, accuracy for future meetings. We've included a breakdown of the total number of active licensees and active retired disabled, uh, those that are in process of being renewed and delinquent for DDS licenses. We've also broken down the total number of licenses issued by year uh, by pathway to licensure. 
The statistics also include a breakdown of the, our permits that have been issued, as well as the breakdown of active licensees by county, so that the committee can see where what committees have potential shortages. Um, and then staff has also included monthly break, breakouts of numbers of applications received, applications approved, uh, licenses issued, um, if, if an application was withdrawn or denied, as well as uh, graphs showing those statistics for the committee's review. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee had. I just had a question from the last meeting was, um, and I don't know what's on this, the difference between the retired and inactive. So I don't know if everybody knows the difference between those two. So the, the inactive and retired, so retired and other boards have, there's various meetings, but for our particular board, if you're in, meet a certain category and you're of age to collect social security, in essence, if you would like to renew your license, you could get a 50% waiver on your fee. Uh, however, the dentist that has a retired license would only be able to uh, provide services for nonprofit. And in, uh, renewals would also include continuing education, would still be required with the retired license. In essence, it's an active license. The inactive license is for a, a licensee who does not want to currently practice, but wants to maintain their licensure in California. And they would not be required to complete any of the continuing education, but they would be required to continue to pay the biennial renewal fee. So essentially a retired dentist can still, say, teach at a school or <clears throat> as, as far as in, in relationship to an inactive. Inactive is just, you can't do anything. As long as they were in compliance with the laws stated uh, for requirements for a retired license, then there shouldn't be any issue. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody knows that. And, and I think that this is an issue that the board may want to tackle in the future is um, what does retired really mean? Mm -hmm. Right now we have, we don't have really, retired for the dental board right now doesn't mean essentially what most of the rest of the world assumes retirement is. Essentially, you're not going to practice again. You, you, you want people to know if they go to the website that you're retired, mm -hmm. that that you're not delinquent, that you're not canceled, that essentially you're, you're retired. Mm -hmm. uh, w it's not quite so clear yet with the dental board. We need to work our way there. Um, so that's probably something that we should agendize for a future discussion. Yeah, thank you. I think we'll do that. So can, you, can we put that down for something in the future? Yes, I'll make a note of that. Especially for um, um, even teaching. I think a person should keep his CEs up if they're teaching. So I think that's very important. Or she, I'm sorry. I do like your question with respect to inactive and and retired, but and we're we're going to be working through it. However, can that be um, California's big state? Is that is can that be published anywhere? Can that be published on our website or in publications as well? I mean, if we're we're if we don't have a clear, we need to have a clear handle on, on what is inactive or what constitutes inactive and re, and retirement. So post on the website what the different well, meanings. Well, I don't are. know. Whatever, for for whatever reason, because, you know, we have a lot of people that are just some are just leaving the state mm -hmm. and really don't know the full consequences of of of, of leaving. Right. And not. To, Although they don't, um, they have no plans of returning, maybe life, you know, maybe life circumstances causes them to, to return. 
but they need to know the full consequence. Of, of I believe we may have something on our website, but I'll double check and make sure. And um, if it needs to be clarified, we'll be happy to update that to make sure that that's okay. clarified. So we're going to agendize that for a future uh, discussion. I think that's important because that, that's a big one. So the inactive status is uh, DC wide, DCA wide. So all boards handle inactive licenses the same way we do. But I, I think for a future discussion, we can agendize this to clarify and whether or not the board would want to put some sort of clarification on the website. So we can agendize that for the future. Do we have to take any? We don't take any comments or anything. No public comment. Do you have any public comment on uh, this issue? No. Okay. Great. Move on to number four. Right? Um, discussion and possible action regarding requirements for the issuance of a new license to replace a canceled license pursuant to Business and Professionals Code <coughs> Section 1718.3. So as part of this committee's responsibility, this meeting, uh, this committee meets in closed session to consider applications for new licenses to replace canceled licenses, as is uh, stated in Business and Professions Code Section 1718.3. And so this section outlines all of the requirements. Um, so to break it down, there, there's been, um, there's been licensees that go maybe out of state or forget to renew their licenses, and this is applicable for both dental assisting and dentistry. And if they do not renew their license for a period of five years, it goes from a delinquent status to a canceled status. And once the license becomes canceled, a licensee can no longer call the board and, and complete the, retire, the required continuing education and essentially just renew their license and pay those fees. They, at that point, at the canceled status, have to apply to the board to be considered by the committee um, for recommendation to have that new license issued to replace that canceled license. And so over the course of the last few years, we've received um, some recommendations and comments from applicants that have been having to go through this pathway that perhaps the board may want to consider um, allowing a licensee to just verify for or, or qualify for licensure through one of the other pathways, the current pathways to licensure. So we have the four pathways for dentistry and then we have the three pathways for RDAs. Um, reason being, it can be very costly over the period of time that they perhaps didn't pay the renewal because they would be responsible for paying all of their back renewal fees, all of their delinquency fees, and completing all of those required continuing education units. Um, but the way the law was written, it doesn't really allow the board the discretion to allow an applicant to um, apply via another pathway to licensure. So at this point, staff wanted to bring this forward to the committee as a work item uh, to consider and discuss whether or not in the future legislation could be proposed that would in essence uh, allow an applicant the option of either applying for licensure, a new license to replace a canceled license through the current requirements outlined in B Business and Professions Code Section 1718.3, or allow them the option of qualifying for that new license via one of the other pathways to licensure. And so that's, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have today, but that in essence is what uh, staff has brought forward to the committee today. Just a comment, I, th I think it's, it's important that we do this and move rapidly because we want to bring more people uh, back online in California, I think, and bring more um, qualified people to the state. I think it's very important. So I think the sooner we help these people, let's just say they move to a different country or move you know, back uh, from a different state, get them back into the system quicker is probably uh, something we will want to do. I think that, that's important. We haven't had a lot of, uh, we haven't had an enormous number of people questioning whether or not uh, they want to uh, pay, essentially pay all the back fees. It can be 
it can go into the tens of thousands of dollars to do that. Um, so I think that that's what we wanted. We wanted to get the discussion going. Uh, also, in the event that um, uh, somebody introduces legislation this year, that we wouldn't be caught off guard, uh, that we can you know start talking about it. Spencer brought up whether or not this issue should go in the ledge committee or not. I, and if this committee else uh, licensure certification permits came up with a recommendation and then sent it to the ledge committee, if the ledge committee didn't agree, I would say send it to the board to decide who there's whose recommendation they're going to take. Possible? I'm getting my law that degree. That is possible. <laughs> 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 it will require a statutory change. And yes. the legislation committee yes. addresses those issues. Um, so the question would be who would be making the recommendation to the board. But at least the discussion can begin at, at this juncture. Okay. Thank you. You know, I, I agree that this is an important issue for us to address. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I've had some inquiries, uh, not official, regarding this, this issue from <clears throat> dentists who had more than five years of, uh, of non-renewal and the expense involved and the rather cumbersome and onerous process of coming up with all of this stuff. So I think it would be important for us to, to consider this. Uh, again, <clears throat> it's probably a, a legislative, it would require a legislative change. Uh, I think this committee would be well to recommend to the board that they refer to the legislative committee for consideration of revising legislation relating to renewal of canceled licenses. Uh, now, there, we, could, we could go on and discuss it more at this point, but I think we pretty much said what we need to say. This is something that we would like, as a committee, would like to see changed, looked at, and possibly changed. Uh, we can't do that as ourselves, as this committee, except recommend to the board that the board approve making that change. And if so, then legislative and regulatory committee would have the responsibility of proceeding. Is that correct? That is correct. So <clears throat> my motion would be that the examination committee uh, recommend, I mean, uh, the, the licensing certification and permits committee recommend to the board that uh, the uh, approve uh, the consideration of revising the statute regarding uh, issuance of new licenses for canceled licenses and refer that to the legislative and regulatory committee for consideration. Second. I second. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Sarah's going to call the vote in a minute. Have the public comment. Oh, what? public comment. Um, Gail, hello. Gail Mathy, CDA. Um, thank you. That was a great discussion. Um, CDA definitely supports us. We've actually received a couple of calls directly, and. Uh, to offer another kind of lens to look at this, and I actually think it was in Sarah's report. So I received a call from a dentist who had a California license, practiced for a few years, moved to the East Coast, be with his wife's family, practiced there for 25, a long, long, long time, wants to come back and is facing tens of thousands of dollars to do that. And his neighbor can come back, and so he's had a practice this whole time, right? His neighbor can come to California on licensure by credential, has five, you know, more than five years of good practice. So just from a fairness point of view, you know, whether it's couched as we're looking at canceled, you know, how canceled licenses are handled or just looking at if someone meets another pathway, you know, can, can they come in through that pathway? So we've had a couple of instances come to, to uh, CDA to like, can you help us understand this? Um, the other thing I would offer, and this would probably also be part of the ledge committee. So, Last meeting, you folks talked about licensure by credential regs, and there are places where the statute is conflicting because of things that have happened later. This is one of them, right? You had the canceled license, then later licensure by credential. So 
we would CDA would offer that we actually are interested in uh, helping with the statutory. I think it could be a Senate omnibus helping clean up those statutory issues around licensure that have been identified <coughs> in this committee's discussions recently. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> I think it's important to mention too at this point when we look at legislation, as Gail had said. Um, 1718.3 has been on the books for a long time. Essentially, you let your license go, this is the pathway. When the legislation was <coughs> introduced for other pathways, at that time, we would have hoped it would have been caught along the way that essentially this issue might come up. So that's why I think it's really important for board members to be engaged um, in, in every committee um, so that when we're looking at legislation, I mean, staff needs help on this too, seeing if we accept something or if we go on record as supporting something that it's not in conflict with something else. And so uh, <laughs> staff has been alerted to that. We're gonna be look, trying to look, for, look to that in the future. But it's those unintended consequences that we have to be aware of as we st uh, start to look at uh, statutory changes. Uh, st st we've been, um, putting this back and forth, and we think that it would be a relatively simple statutory change. Probably not omnibus bill. It, it probably would not meet the requirements to go into an omnibus bill, but um, it's certainly gonna be on our list, I think. I think what, what was explained to me uh, is that there's a difference between delinquency and just returning your license and the fees correspond to that. So I think that uh, we have to speak to that too, that if somebody just doesn't pay their license and then becomes delinquent, after five years, you know, you lose your license. If a person actually turns in their license, it's a different path. Mm -hmm. So I didn't understand that until just recently, and uh, we can kind of smooth that out a little bit too. I think it would make it a lot more streamlined and, and um, less confusion. Back to the vote. Okay, we're going to bring um, that to a vote. Yes. Dr. Lai? Yes. Judy Forsythe? Yes. Yvette Chappelle Ingram? Yes. Dr. Morrow? Yes. Dr. Wu? Yes. Motion passes. So, six future agenda items. And uh, uh, Dr. Morrow has passed this to me. Maybe you can explain why you want to put this on the agenda for next time. Yes, for agenda item number seven, um, I, I have an issue that I would like to present to the committee for consideration for agendizing for discussion at a future uh, committee meeting. And that has to do with the subject of a faculty or teaching permit. Business and Professions Code 1626 obviously states that it's unlawful for any person to engage in the practice of dentistry in California without a valid license. Uh, 1626 subsection C also states uh, there are a number of exemptions to that. And 1626 C states the practice of dentistry by licensed dentists of other states or countries while appearing and operating as bona fide clinicians or instructors in dental colleges approved by the Dental Board of California. So this is an exemption that a faculty member can hold a faculty appointment in a dental school in California that does not have a California license. As long as they have a license in another state or it could even be in another country. Uh, these California, these non-licensed California dentists that hold faculty appointments in one or, one, one or more of the six dental schools in California, which by the way, California has the largest number of dental schools in any state in the United States. They can hold a faculty appointment, which is considered as practicing dentistry without a California license. We have, the, the dental board has no knowledge of how many of these unlicensed California dentists are teaching in dental schools. We have no control over 
the amount of continuing education that they require in order for renewal of their licenses. There are a number of countries in the world that issue dental licenses for life with no requirement whatsoever for uh, continuing education or renewal of those licenses. And I have a concern that we do not know who these people are, where they are. They have not been vetted by us in any way. We have not done a background check on them. Uh, there's, a, there's an assumption that the university or the, or the dental school that is employing them has done a background check, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, there's an assumption there that they're controlling our risk and to assume that somebody else is controlling your risk is very poor risk management, in my opinion. Uh, there are a number of states that have faculty or teaching permits in place. Just to name a few of those, Alabama, Florida, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Washington. These are permits that are applied to their state dental board for teaching purposes. They were renewed on either an annual or a semi-annual basis. And those individuals need to meet the same uh, license renewal requirements from a standpoint of continued education that state license holders do in that state. So this is an issue that I think I would like to see addressed. And obviously we are limited in how we can discuss it here except the fact of whether or not it be placed on an, as an agenda item for a future committee meeting. I have a question, Dr. Morrow. They're, they're not um, regulated under a special permit? Special permits are only for those non-California licensed dentists mm -hmm. who wish to be involved in the faculty practice of the institution. Those special permits are limited to full-time faculty members only, and their practice opportunity is limited to no more than one day per week, and it must be in the university's faculty practice system, not in the community. And there are limits to the number of those permits that each school can obtain. Obviously, it's something we really need to talk about, um, and it's going to take time on, on, on this agenda item. So, okay, can we put that on for a future agenda item, please? Got it. Thank you. Would you like me to make a motion that it be placed on a future agenda? Yes. I, I would like. A motion is not required. Just a just a statement from statement? the chair that it will be added to a future okay, agenda. Okay, it'll be added. Thank please, you. thanks. Okay, that's it. Seven. Can I say public comment? You can take public comment. Okay, we missed one that. last time. Public comment. Okay. Seeing none. It's adjourned. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Witch is approaching, so stand by. Okay, at this point, I'd suggest we go into recess for our lunch break. Can everybody be back by 1.30? And we'll resume with our next committee meeting. Okay, I want to call the Legislative and Regulatory Committee meeting to order. Uh, I'm going to call the roll. Fran Burton. Steve Morrow. Here. Stephen Chan. Here. Katie Dawson. Here. Deborah Wu. Here. There's a quorum. So if you would please look at item two, the um, approval of the May 2016 minutes.
Are there any additions, deletions, corrections? Seeing none. Is there a motion? Motion to accept. Motion Wu, second Burton. Fran Burton, yes. Steve Morrow? Abstain. Steve Chan? Abstain, I wasn't there. Katie Dawson? I'm sorry. I was absent, so I abstained. Okay. Deborah Wu. Accept. Now, is that correct? The yeah. motion is from this body and not the, the members of the last committee? That's correct. The okay. So the, so the vote is 2 3. There were two abstentions. Three abstentions. Three, three abstentions, it passes. Okay. Okay, the next item is the tentative legislative calendar, which is enclosed. Um, this is the legislative calendar for those who have not been a part of this committee in, in the past. And um, the most important item for right now is um, the February 17th date, which was the last date to introduce new bills. And then before we meet again, the legislature will be on recess. So there's no motion on this item. The next item is a discussion and possible action on legislation. Sarah Wallace, Assistant Executive Officer. <clears throat> so the, the board is tracking several pieces of legislation and actually last uh, Friday was the last day to introduce bills to the legislature, so we, we have become aware of several more bills that aren't on the agenda at this time, but please note that we will be discussing those at future meetings and that we are aware of those. Um, so today we have five bills that we're going to be discussing and one bill that we've included uh, for informational purposes only and we, th there's no need for discussion on that item. So we have Assembly Bill 12, Assembly Bill 15, Assembly Bill 40, which is the informational only item, Assembly Bill 224, Assembly Bill 349, and Senate Bill 27. And, and before you start with those, members, I am going to suggest that because some of these bills are spot bills and um, don't have a lot of detail, that we have the discussion that, we, that you want to have, but at this point, because some of them are not what they are going to be, um, it's, we can discuss, but there's no point in projecting what might be or what could be because we don't know. And um, I, I think further, um, I don't think that at this point it's, it's necessary to do a support or oppose. I think that we certainly can do a watch, but at this point, we don't have the detail for that. So that's my advisement going forward. So starting with Assembly Bill 12, <clears throat> uh, this bill requires different law, uh, rulemaking agencies uh, to be required to review our current rulemakings and just determine if there's duplicate uh, duplicate rulemakings or inconsistencies and basically just mandating a review of all of our regulations. Um, it is noted in the analysis that this would uh, require a significant amount of staff resources to accomplish. I would like to note though that this is a bill language that's typically seen almost every year. So I, I am questioning whether or not it may be a spot bill at this time. And so it, 
for that reason, staff is recommending a watch position. Any questions or comments? Any public comment? And I would move a watch on the AB 12. Steve Morrill? Yes. Steve Chan? Yes. Katie Dawson? Yes. Deborah Wu? Yes. And I would, I'm a, a Wu. I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a yes as well. <laughs> okay. All right. That was AB 12. <clears throat> Assembly Bill 15 is also included in your board meeting packets. This bill would increase Denical funding and it would be allocated to increasing reimbursement rates for the 15 most common prevention, treatment, and oral evaluation services to the regional average commercial rates. Um, this, there is no fiscal impact to the dental board, and the dental board actually wouldn't have anything to do with this. This would uh, be for Department of Health Care Services to handle, but this was included for the board's information. At this point, staff is recommending a watch position. <coughs> I would add to this that I suspect that this has been introduced as part of the funds that the Department of Health Care Services will receive for dental care. Any questions or comments? Any public comment? So the position is watch on this. Excuse me. Um, Sarah, in the memo it says, uh, um, let me see. Okay, got it. Forget it. That's it. Go ahead. It's been moved by Chad. Is there a second? Second. Second moral. Steve Morrill. Yes. Steve Chan. Yes. Debbie, uh, uh, Katie <laughs> Dawson. <laughs> it's all right. I just called you Debbie, so it's okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. And Deborah Wu. Did you really mean it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> So we are skipping AB 40 because it was just included for informational purposes and moving on to AB 224 by Assemblymember Thurmond. Uh, right now, this bill is uh, considered a spot bill and makes non-substantive changes to BMP Code Section 1601.4. Um, it's too soon to determine the impact of the bill that the, that I'll have on the board. Um, and at this point, board staff recommends taking a watch position. It's my understanding that this this could be a vehicle um, from Assemblymember Thurmond um, to move uh, provisions related to general anesthesia. Uh, move a watch. It's been moved by Morrill. Second. Okay. Second Chan. Steve Morrill. Yes. Steve Chan. Yes. Katie Dawson. Um, Deborah Wu. Yes. Ann Burton. It Sarah, before you move on, uh, there were two more bills introduced last Friday that we'll bring forward. Um, also, spot bills. Um, one, uh, two coming from the Senate. Uh, Senator Bates and Senator Glazer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, that are sort of being held for the same issue to address the um, things that may come out of our pediatric anesthesia report. So we'll be watching those and reporting back to the board. Uh, next, we have AB 349 by Assemblymember McCarty. And this bill would require the DCA boards ex expedite the initial licensure process for an applicant who's been issued a special immigrant visa through Section 1059 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, at this point, this bill is believed to be a spot bill and will, is 
probably will be de further developed later. So at this point, staff recommends taking a watch position. I suspect that this may be one of many bills that we will see this year related to, to immigration. Um, and they may all or they may not um, make some requirement of DCA or the board. Okay. Second. Second. Wu. Mm -hmm. Any public comment? Steve Morrow? Yes. Steve Chad? Yes. Katie Dawson? Deborah Wu? Yes. And I am a yes. <clears throat> And last, we have Senate Bill 27, and this bill would waive the initial application and licensure fees for honorably discharged veterans entering an occupation requiring licensure in California, and only one fee waiver would, would be granted to a veteran. So this would be applicable to all of our licensure categories, and this is similar to other military legislation that we've seen in past years. At this point, staff recommends a watch, oh, I'm sorry, staff recommended a support position of this bill. I didn't write the memo, so I'm going to recommend a watch position. <laughs> okay, and that answers my question because I'd asked the question of Lucy, didn't we already do this one? Okay. So, at this point, I think it's pretty early to tell. So, for that reason alone, I w would recommend a watch. But I would too. And so I'm going to move a watch on this. Morrow? Yes. Chan? Yes. Dawson? Yes. Wu? Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay. So the next Item is agenda item five, update on pending regs. So we have quite the regulatory agenda for this year. Uh, staff is still working on the development of the continuing education and basic life support equivalency standards uh, to bring back to the board during a uh, meeting this year. The dental assisting comprehensive regulatory proposal is in motion and as was reported at the joint meeting, we are holding two more regulatory workshops this year with the expectation that the language will be presented to the board and the council at the August meeting for promulgation. The interim therapeutic restoration uh, rulemaking package uh, draft language was presented to the board and the council at the December board meeting, and I did not receive any stakeholder feedback on that, so I'm going to be working with legal counsel to move forward with drafting the initial rulemaking for the board's consideration at hopefully the May meeting. The elective facial cosmetic surgery permit application requirements uh, and renewal requirements that proposed language was approved by the board at the December meeting, and staff is working on the development of the initial rulemaking documents to, to publish. The fee increase is still going through the approval process. It's currently with agency, and we are awaiting it uh, to be finalized by agency and move on to DOF before we can file with the Office of Administrative Law. The institutional standards Rulemaking was also approved by the board at the December meeting, and staff is in the process of drafting those initial rulemaking documents. Uh, <clears throat> as far as the licensure by credential application requirements, the board uh, reviewed some draft language at a couple of previous meetings, and staff is working on finalizing the draft language to present to the board again at a future meeting, um, most likely this upcoming May meeting. And mobile and portable dental unit registration had been approved by the board, but we've found some issues with the draft language. So we will be bringing it back to the board at a future meeting. So um, I expect that the May and August meetings will most likely be pretty heavy on with regulatory packages for the board's consideration. Okay, there's no action on this. Are there any questions or comments? Any public comment? I just wanna let the board or the committee know of course, Lucy, uh, 
has gone to work for SOLID. So we have posted or in the process of recruiting to fill behind her. We're going to try to fill that position as quickly as possible, but as we know, finding somebody to fill that, um, that position of legislative and regulatory, anima and, um, regulatory analyst is difficult. Um, learning regulations is not an easy task, so we're just hoping that we're gonna get some qualified candidates and try to fill the position as quickly as we can. In the meantime, Sarah's gonna to try to do her best to try to move a few things along. Um, so we'll see how we get, but we'll ask for your patience. Um, we recognize that we need to get these things rolling and we're gonna do it to the best that we can. Thank you. Item five is public, item, public comment on items not on the agenda. Is there any public comment? Item six is future agenda items. Stakeholders, and that includes board members, um, are encouraged to propose some ideas for consideration um, for future meetings. So seeing nothing. Wait, excuse me, friend. Um, I think some of us got lost here based on the numbers that you referenced. Six is discussion of prospective legislative proposals. And seven is public comment on items not on the agenda. I hadn't gotten there yet. I was doing future agenda items. Okay, so you jumped over, you jumped over to no, eight. No, I was doing six which is future agenda items. My agenda says six is discussion of prospective legislative proposals. Is that what? Yours doesn't say. We gave you a special packet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have that same thing? Oh. oh, sorry, wrong agenda. Sorry about that, you're right. So, having done. You're on six, Fran. Six. Yeah. Number six is discussion of prospective legislative proposals. Seeing no comment, um, number seven is public items, public comment on items not on the agenda. Uh, Mary McCune with California Dental Association. Um, I know that there were a lot of bills that were not um, put on the table today because they were introduced, um, I think, last week. But I did just want to mention that AB 1277 from Assemblymember Daly um, relates to water lines that are associated after the Anaheim Clinic incident. Um, it's currently in spot bill format, and CDA is in talks with the office, and I just wanted to put that out for a point okay. of information. Okay, and we're aware of the fact that there are other bills, but because they were not on the agenda, we know about that bill. Correct. So. I just want to let you guys know just okay. because CDA is in talks, so just for okay. information. Thank you. Is there anything else? So number eight, then, is future agenda items. Seeing none. Item nine is committee member comments on items not on the agenda. Are there comments?
Okay. Seeing nothing, then we are adjourned. <laughs> Fastest ledge meeting in <laughs> history. I want to be on the record. Okay, <laughs> anesthesia. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is a newly formed committee. I want to welcome you and uh, appreciate your willingness to serve on this committee. I uh, want to uh, call the ad attendance roll to begin with. Uh, I am present. Fran Burton. Here. Steve Chan. Here. Ross Lai. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the back row. Calling Ross live. <laughs> He's here. Here. Here, here. Ang Lei. Yeah. Meredith McKenzie. And Bruce Witcher. Here. here. Okay. Uh, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to take item agenda item number four uh, out of sequence as a need for uh, staff uh, to be able to present this before they have to leave. So uh, item number four. Thank you. <clears throat> Sarah Wallace, Assistant Executive Officer. And uh, in your agenda item packets, we've included uh, general anesthesia and conscious sedation evaluation statistics for the committee's review. As you know, uh, on-site inspections and evaluations are required for the general anesthesia and conscious sedation permits. And we do have a staff person in our office that schedules those evaluations with subject matter experts. And so this gives the committee an overview for the last 12 months of uh, those evaluations that passed, failed, permits that were canceled, or and evaluations that were postponed for both the GA and the CS evaluations. There were a couple of issues that I wanted to point out to the committee. You'll notice on the statistics that this, they also include statistics from March in April of 2017 uh, with 22 pass evaluations and 19 pass evaluations. Those are anticipated passes as those are the number of evaluations that are scheduled at this time. You'll also notice on those two rows that there are two permits that have already been canceled by request for each of those. Um, that is accurate information. Those permit holders were contacted to schedule their evaluations for March and April and they opted uh, requesting to request to cancel those permits. The first one for March, yes, at the bottom, March and April at the bottom. That's 2017. So it starts with March 2016, and then third row up from the bottom. Okay. Okay. All right. So those are anticipated. Um, a couple of other points of clarification. Uh, permits canceled for noncompliance doesn't necessarily mean that they were failed evaluations. It, it doesn't mean they were failed evaluations at all, actually. It means that they were notified that they needed to have their evaluation, but they had not responded in a timely manner. And so they're sent two notifications to schedule their evaluation, and the third notification is a cancellation of their permit. Um, according to staff, usually this happens if a licensee doesn't update their address of record with the board and doesn't get the uh, notifications. Um, postponement due to no evaluators is due to DBC staff. 
if we're unable to find subject matter experts available to go out in the field and perform the evaluators, those evaluations are postponed for that month. Um, and they're usually scheduled in the next batch, which is two to three months out. Uh, postponement by request is usually due to the permit holder. Uh, same with permit canceled by request. Uh, postponement by request is typically done when there's emergencies that arise with all of the very various folks that are involved with the evaluation. Um, more often than not, some, one of those um, people have an unanticipated issue come up and so their absence impacts the evaluation in its totality. And then we have permits that are canceled by request, typically due to non-use. Um, so I w wanted to go over that in case there were any questions. The statistics also include uh, information relating the, to the medical general anesthesia evaluations and uh, a graph relating to the number of evaluations completed per month. I have a question through the chair. Yes. Um, because we are new to this committee, um, how often, you, you said something about how often um, evaluations are scheduled. Um, is there a backlog or all evaluations done timely? My understanding is that there is, is not a backlog of scheduling the evaluations. Um, we typically send out scheduling notices, I think up to 30 people per, I'd say 30, 25 to 30 on average on a monthly basis. Of course, you'll see due to availability and cancellations um, for unforeseen circumstances, um, sometimes they have to be rescheduled for a couple months out, but that's not due to noncompliance. So uh, failure to respond is rare uh, in, in the total amount of the evaluations that we're scheduling. But I'm sure Dr. Witcher could also, I know you're very familiar with the program and could also speak to that. Sarah, <clears throat> do we have a, a process in place for recruitment of evaluators. I see here that 13 evaluations were postponed due to a lack of an evaluator. Uh, how, how do we go about recruiting evaluators? Are we needing more evaluators? Can you, can you tell us as a committee a little bit about how, these, uh, how, how the evaluators are recruited? Are they paid? Are they compensated in some way? How does this work? How does the evaluation process sure. work? The evaluators are calibrated. We we were doing an annual. Should we have this agendized for a future meeting? I don't know. At the bottom of the chart, it says there is great need for consultation evaluators throughout California, and under that, it says the board is actively recruiting for the evaluation program. So, um, in my opinion, if you there can be some discussion with respect okay. to that. Thank you. Just so a general overview, uh, we're consistently recruiting. Um, we need to, to add on to our recruitment, especially this year. Um, but evaluators would go through a calibration. Uh, evaluators are paid a per diem and then their travel related expenses as well. And so uh, the, the issues as I understand it are typically in, in certain areas, not all areas, a lot of the rural areas uh, we have difficulty recruiting um, evaluators for those areas, and so uh, we, we're constantly evaluating how to make it more attractive, I guess you could mm -hmm. say, uh, to get the basically the volunteers out there to help um, evaluate these permit holders. Good. All right, thank you. Dr. Moore, I have a question. Yes. Okay, so um, we have 857 GA permits in the state of California. Would you know how many MD anesthesiologists there are that hold the permit? Anesthesiologists? Well, like, uh, like you're out of the 857 GA permit holders, how many are physicians? For the medical general anesthesia? Yeah, for general anesthesia. 
It's in your table. Yeah. <clears throat> It's under your licensee table. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's in the licensee table. Oh, okay. 78. Sorry. That was not in this committee. Okay. <clears throat> Basically a 79. Well, thank you. <laughs> and that, uh, the, the general anesthesia, if I may, through the chair. Sure. Uh, the general anesthesia permit holders are basically oral and maxillofacial surgeons, dentist anesthesiologists, and a handful of general dentists who have done the mandatory training. The medical general anesthesiologists are counted separately. They're not in that pool of 857 permits. No, that's in addition to. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions uh, to Sarah? Sarah, does that complete your report? That completes my report. Okay. Any uh, any comments or questions from members of the public? Okay. <clears throat> I don't believe this agenda item needs any action on our part. It's informational only. Okay. So now we will go back to agenda item uh, Excuse number. Excuse me. Could, could I just make a quick sure. comment? Sure. Yes. Um, when I was on LCP committee, I tracked evaluations, number of evaluators in each category every year. And I have data going back eight years. And I surprised, it was easy for me because I had the program all set up so I just entered the current numbers for this year. And so that's circulating around and uh, I can make that available for anybody who's interested. Okay. It basically shows that the number of evaluations is significantly up over last year. However, our number of total evaluators is down slightly. And that is a trend that has existed for a number of years, mainly due to do, losing a lot of our evaluators from retirement. I like it. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Moving on to agenda item number two, uh, discussion and possible action regarding the February 13th legislative hearing relating to the board's pediatric anesthesia study. <clears throat> I hope that, that most of you were able to watch the, uh, the, the tape uh, that was posted, I did. I found it very informative and very, uh, uh, a very good uh, experience. Uh, I was not able to attend in person, uh, and I think maybe we have a report from either Dr. Witcher or maybe Karen, uh, who were both in attendance, I believe. Yes, we were, and, and Fran was there also. And Fran also was there, mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, it would be, I think it would be good for us as a committee to hear a firsthand uh, report as far as uh, those that were in attendance are concerned. Um, you know, since I was in the middle of it, Karen probably has a better perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Is this what we call a handoff? I can, I can, I can do it if you like. But I thought it would be interesting to hear your perspective. Too. Oh, I work for you. <laughs> <laughs> My perspective doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and take this one, and then you can add anything. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a fairly lengthy hearing. Um, you know, uh, the, the board had uh, the opportunity to kind of lead off, and uh, although we didn't submit a written statement, um, we did provide some PowerPoints that kind of illustrated some of the salient points. And what we did basically is kind of give a little bit of background and then just really focus on our recommendations that came out of our December 1st meeting. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about the anesthesia report itself uh, but because we thought that the recommendations were what everybody really had questions about. Uh, and so we tried to give a little bit of background on how those were arrived at and, uh, and w why we made the recommendations that we did. Um, and then we took questions and the questions were really good. Um, they showed a lot of insight into the issue, a lot of concern about it, and um, you know it was, uh, I think, a good inquiry. And I know we kept track of some of the questions, and I can repeat some of those for you just to summarize. Um, I think there was a sentiment uh, that we expressed in our report that our general anesthesia conscious sedation program is sufficient, but that we would like to make it better. And I think that was. I heard that expressed by some of the committee members. I don't know that all of them shared that, but that was expressed. Um, there was genuine concern among them about how our recommendations might affect access to care issues. 
and um, one concern is if we make it more onerous for anesthesia services to be pro provided in the office, would they then be <coughs> displaced to ambulatory care centers and hospitals that are already impacted? And so that was, it was just a concern. Uh, and also there was a concern that there is very, very real risk from deferred treatment as much as there is from, or maybe not as much, but in addition to treatment itself. So there was an attempt to understand where the equation is in, in that regard. Um, and another good question was uh, how many patients would be affected by the changes in the recommendations? And that's not an easy number to arrive at because as we pointed out in our report, we don't actually know the number of cases being done. We have some guesstimates, but no hard numbers because our board statistics are not collected that way. Um, other questions were what could be done to get more different types of general anesthesia providers into dental offices, i.e., how could we make this more attractive to MD anesthesiologists, and what could be done to allow the CRNAs to provide anesthesia in this setting. And there was, there was some discussion on all of these, but those are, the, those are kind of the, the ones that stood out to me that I made note of at the meeting. And um, I think at the end of the hearing, they said, well, we're going to go away and deliberate on this. And, and um, you know, they kind of picked up the ball. They didn't really give us any additional direction. Uh, I was, you know, that may yet happen. I don't know if they'll come back to us and want further clarification or further testimony or something. but. Uh, that is how we left it. I mean, do you have anything to add? Or? Uh, I would just add that it was uh, very cordial. It was pretty much repetition of what's already been said, but the difference here is that uh, Senate B&P committee, we had four or five new members who had not been involved with the discussion before. So I think that they, uh, some of them, Dr. Pan, who is a pediatrician by trade and has, was with the assembly and is now with the Senate it was asking many of the questions and he's very interested and concerned about access to care um, because in his practice he dealt with the, um, how did he phrase it? Thank you, special needs. And Dr. Chan also was attending the hearing. He, uh, he was there uh, listening and watching. In the, in the board binder is, a, a, is a, the agenda, so you'll get an opportunity to see the stakeholders who were there and gave testimony. Um, everybody was allotted a certain amount of time. Pretty much the board was given the most time because we presented everything initially. Everybody else was held to between two and five minutes for their presentation. Uh, I think I agree with Dr. Witcher in that a lot of questions, uh, good questions were generated. I think that the discussion will continue. And I think out of that discussion, you had uh, three members that introduced spot bills uh, to see where this discussion is going to go, as I mentioned before. Two senators and, uh, of course, Assemblymember Thurman uh, will be taking something um, forward. And I would add to that. Um, that we were asked at least three different times in three different ways why the subcommittee recommendation was not accepted by the full board. Um, and although I think that we did a good job of, of responding to that, in my mind, that's no different in what you see anywhere. It's a recommendation. And um, it, you know, what follows hopefully from that is some, some thought and some consideration to go into that final recommendation. But that for me was um, one of the things that really stood out. Uh, the other thing is that even after all of this time, that our statistics are still being questioned um, in terms of the number of deaths, how reports are done, whether what penalty there is if people don't report. And I, I think that as a committee, that is something that we're going to have to be aware of 
going forward in this discussion to just make sure that um, our statistics are accurate and that we can back them up. Mm -hmm. And the anecdotal you, you can't deal with, but as long as we are certain about what the s statistics are as far as we know, um, that should be our guiding point going forward. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> any comments or questions from members of the public on this agenda item? Yes, I'm sorry, Chan, Dr. Chan. Um, just, just another piece of it was, um, there was a comment from uh, Senator Pan that was um, seemingly um, a good overview. He talked about how things were somewhat problem solving and piecemeal as the testimony was coming forward. And he says, in constructing good public policy, we should probably think of a model first and then do the implementation based on those models rather than filling in this piece or filling this piece, having a, a, a person do this or the person does that. So that was pretty interesting how he fra framed that. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments from uh, committee members or questions? Okay. Any comments or questions from members of the public? Mary McCune with CDA. Uh, I just wanted to thank on behalf of CDA, Dr. Witcher, for his uh, really thoughtful presentation at the hearing um, and how the Donald Board really presented the uh, issue of anesthesia as one part of the puzzle. And um, I think that the thoughtful questions from the legislators really reflected that. So we just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Seibert, President-Elect, California Society of Anesthesiologists. Um, we do want to thank the Dental Board for all of its thoughtful consideration of all these issues. Uh, we would like to make the point that in terms of data collection, um, deaths under anesthesia are obviously highly significant events. But there are a number of other highly significant events that can occur that really have not been addressed in any of this. And those would include major complications, morbidity, brain damage, cardiac damage, pulmonary damage from aspiration, events like this that are, are typically included in any um, database of anesthesia complications, and we would urge the dental board to consider those as well as it looks toward uh, data collection in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we did publish our hospitalization cases uh, as part of our board Report. data. Um, I know that some people did not think that perhaps uh, provided sufficient information. We provided the information that we had. So I think to say we didn't address it at all is not entirely accurate. Um, Thank you. Any other comments? I would just add to that comment that when we started this project, it was specific to deaths of children due to general anesthesia. Right. We did expand the study to uh, age 21 and under, or under 21, and uh, commented and reviewed based on different levels of sedation. So. Um, yes, I agree. I, again, our, our specific charge was deaths of children and we obviously went beyond that, but we weren't required to do so by our, by our initial charge. So. Okay. Well, the, the reason we did that is we were asked to look at all the incident reports, sure. which include not only deaths. Right. Uh, unplanned admission to a hospital <coughs> is kind of a standard reporting parameter. It's mm -hmm. probably the highest one on the list of non-lethal type complications. Well, and, <coughs> and I'm... I'm I, I'm glad, and I think it's fortunate that we went, we went beyond what we were specifically asked to do, and I think that's that's a good that's good for us to do. Okay, don't just do the minimum. Okay. I also um, so the legislature asked a repeated question about our data, and I responded in a way that we have, we collect data for our regulatory process and our discipline process, <laughs> and it's very different than 
data that's scientifically laid out for the purpose of reviewing trends or trying to identify challenges. I don't know that we will, that the dental board will ever get to the point where that data, that type, that specific, that accurate data will be available. It's, nobody has taken this on throughout the country um, because it takes a lot of money to do those things and you hire the right people to do those kinds of things. So we're taking a baby step with regard to the notification part of this piece of legislation and I, I think that we'll be reporting that in the next item in number yes. three. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, any other comments? Yes. Uh, in, in looking at from a from a distance and, and seeing how dental practices that practice general anesthesia or conscious sedation in a private setting is much different than a, in a medical in a hospital setting in which a lot of their MDs and anesthesiologists actually go to a clinic that, that are fully equipped and the documentation is quite different than private practice. So I think in looking at it from, from afar, it's, it's two different things. And since we are trying to do that, more record keeping in a, in a, in a more, I guess a, a diverse situation. I mean, a, a more, I say, spread out more. I, I know what the word is, but it's hard to get people that own their practices and, and they're running their own practices to volunteer certain information, which we deem necessary to to come up with some data. Whereas in a hospital setting, it has to be. And so, uh, I don't know how. Like I said, if it will ever be. Perfect. Uh, I think it'd be very difficult for that to be uh, in stone. And I think a part of what was brought up also um, at the, the meeting was um, in, in terms of the data, well, I'll, I'll withhold hold that comment for later. Excuse me. Okay. All right. Any other comments before we move on? Okay. Good. Thank you very much. I think. I think it's been very valuable that uh, this discussion was stimulated, that the discussion came about. I think it's something that needed to be out in the open and discussed. Where it's going to end up, nobody knows at this point. But I think the most valuable thing is that the discussion is happening, has happened and is happening. And we'll just have to wait, wait and watch and see where we go from here. But I, I think, again, the, the most important thing is that the subject has been opened and it has, the, and a discussion has begun. And I think that's good. Okay. Hey, right, moving on to agenda item number three. Uh, update regarding implementation of Assembly Bill 2235 uh, relating to pediatric anesthesia. Basically, the plan is outlined here in this agenda item. Uh, we are going to be working with the Office of Information Services to start to put together a um, courtesy form uh, that will uh, consist of the data points that are outlined in Assemblymember Thurman's bill. And then we'll be sending out notifications to our licensees to indicate that there's a new reporting format. We're asking them to use the courtesy form until regulations can be developed. Um, and we're hoping uh, that that's, that's going to be well received and um, we'll begin to start to collect this new notification. 1680Z prior to this legislation just required licensees to notify the board of a death or a hospitalization. And we received notifications in many different ways. Uh, some of them came via email, some came through written uh, U.S. Post Office delivered. Uh, some information was very lengthy, others were just, I'm, I'm reporting to you. And then uh, what happened when we received each of those reports is we opened up a case and started to gather the information. So uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, we are going to be putting notices out to our licensees and on our website regarding the requirement for informed consent. 
uh, that, that language is pretty specific and we're gonna be disseminating that uh, information out to the licensees. I think pretty much the action plan is outlined in the memo, unless anybody has any questions. Karen, mm -hmm. the, uh, the sort of interim form or the courtesy form that could be used while the, while the permanent form is being developed, mm -hmm. is that something that's going to be accessible on the board's website, or will this be a paper form that people need to uh, address? Ultimately, what we would like to do is put the courtesy uh, form on the website in fillable form, so they can just go to the website, fill it out, mm -hmm. print it out, and either send it to us or scan it to us. All right. So that's the hope. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? Yes, Bruce. Uh, there was another directive in the Thurman Bill that had to do with uh, the board, to the extent resources are available, to encourage uh, reporting of near-miss type events right. to a nonprofit database. Um, you know, uh, we have talked about this a little bit. Um, where do we want to go with that? Well, again, with, with resources available, uh, I think that's pretty much up to our, our uh, administrative staff about resources. I think it would be good uh, to collect that data, so-called near misses. Uh, but again, it's a matter of priorities as far as where our staff's time is spent and where our, where our dollars are spent. Uh, so that was, a, that was an option, I think, in the bill, was, was to consider this. It wasn't a requirement. So I think we should be aware of that, and, and we should look at it from a standpoint of, is that valuable enough and important to us that we go for it right now, or is it something we need to put on, on, a, on a, a rear burner on the stove and, and bring forward at a future time? I guess I'm getting ahead of myself as uh, proposing that as a possible future agenda item for the committee. <laughs> oh, I, well, you can wait until uh, agenda item number eight, okay? okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay? And I have a question. Yes. Um, and through the chair, this is to Karen. Um, the notice here talks about the change as proposed in section 1680Z, 1A through C. And since that is not more detailed here, but for purposes of the audience, can you generally talk about how the form will be different from what we're using now? Um, so <clears throat> what, we're, what the requirement is now is that if you, and uh, A through C essentially is outlining when you have to report to the board. So it's during a death or a hospitalization or learning of a hospitalization within 24 hours or a certain time. Seven uh, days. Yeah. Seven days. Seven anything. days, okay. So um, how, how the Thurman legislation changes this is now the board will be requiring that that notification be in a certain format. And that's what we're gonna be developing. The staff will be developing the form, essentially, that will need to actually be in a regulatory package, but in the meantime, we're going to develop the form in a way and announce it in a way that it's a courtesy form so we can't require people to fill out that form, but we're hoping that they understand what, was, what this discussion has been about for the last year and that they will essentially comply with that. Yeah. And that despite and until there is something more permanent, the law still has not changed. You still have to report, okay? Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll make that clear. Yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to just speculate here that if for some reason uh, a licensee decides that they don't want to use the courtesy form, this could be a form that our investigators use when they start to investigate the case so we could still obtain the information. Yeah, as, as, as I understand, uh, Assembly Bill 2235 had some specific requirements 
that this form, information that this form would collect. However, I don't believe it was limited to that. So the That's board correct. might decide that on this form that there's some additional information that we feel is valuable to obtain that was not required by, by the assembly bill. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so there's a process where I think this committee will come into play from the standpoint of discussing and finalizing what information that we think is important for us together on this form in addition to what is required by Assembly Bill 2235. Yes. Okay. Just by way of information, I think there's about 20 items and it, you know there's a long list of things which really kind of covers most of the basic I think kind of parameters that people look at. Right. I, I think it, I'm sure it does, but it still leaves us open with the option of adding a few more if we feel that that's uh, important. We're not limited to just what the bill requires. True. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Moving forward to agenda item number five. I understand we have a representative here from uh, the Nurse Anesthetist Association. Is that right? Okay. Uh, if you could come up to the table and uh, introduce yourself and welcome. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Fantastic. Um, members of the dental board, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Karen Karp. I'm the practice director of the California Association of Nurse Anesthetists, and I've been a certified registered nurse anesthetist since 1989. And I have with me today Roberta Ashley, also representing CANA. Dr. Ashley has been a CRNA since 2001. She earned her Doctor of Educational Psychology degree in 2015, and she serves as the Director of the Oral Maxillofacial Anesthesiology Education in the Keck School of Medicine at University of Southern California. She's also a board-certified simulation educator, specializing in acute crisis resource management based on the operator anesthetist model. First, we'd like to thank the dental board and this committee for your leadership on the issue of pediatric dental anesthesia safety. CANA has supported the board's efforts through input during the report process, and last week supported the board's recommendations at the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee's informational hearing on the report. Uh, CANA also echoes the report's assertion that any change put forward needs to strike the balance between established practices and evidence-based changes and that provide greater patient safety as well as the need to examine the effect on any proposed new legislation on access to care and cost effectiveness for pediatric dental patients in a resource-constrained healthcare system. <clears throat> Certified registered nurse anesthetists are advanced practice registered nurses who are required to have a minimum of eight years of combined education, training, and critical care nursing before passing a national certifying examination and entering the anesthesia workforce with a master's or doctoral degree. By the year 2021, all nurse anesthesia programs will award a doctoral degree upon completion. There are 2,400 active licensed CRNAs practicing in California. CRNAs do not require physician supervision in California and practice independently in every healthcare setting where anesthesia is delivered from acute care hospitals to ambulatory surgery centers and physician offices. CRNAs are the primary providers of anesthesia in rural and medically underserved communities, administering 65% of anesthesia services to these populations. Currently, nine counties in California depend solely on CRNAs for anesthesia care and services. However, CRNAs also <laughs> practice in team care settings on a daily basis, collaborating with surgeons, obstetricians, anesthesiologists, dentists, and other healthcare providers to deliver safe, high-quality, cost-effective care. 
One current statutory requirement impedes upon CRNA's ability to offer services in dental office settings. Even though CRNAs have independent scope of practice, we currently are unable to obtain an anesthesia permit individually from the dental board, like our other anesthesia provider colleagues. Instead, dentists, many of whom practice in rural or underserved communities that may only have CRNA providers available, must obtain their own anesthesia permit, which requires additional education, fees, and administration. This creates an undue burden on dentists and a disincentive for using CRNAs in dental offices, which currently does not exist in any other setting. This includes hospitals and dental ambulatory surgery centers where CRNAs currently provide pediatric dental anesthesia on a regular basis, as well as office settings for a multitude of other specialties. We do not see this as a scope battle between anesthesia providers. and We work collaboratively in our daily lives, and there's a need for dental anesthesia in our communities that provides opportunities for everyone. Kenna asks that this inequity in the dental permitting process be addressed in any legislation and or regulatory proposals moving forward to implement the board's recommendations so that CRNAs can be utilized more easily in dental office settings to serve communities in need. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for meeting with us. Appreciate Welcome. it. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to address? Could you please repeat the number of CRNAs in California again for me? Yes, there's 2,400. 2,400, okay. mm -hmm. thank you. Any other? Yes. You, you talked about there being nine counties mm -hmm. where um, at this point you work primarily. Um, are those also the rural counties that you talked about? They are. They're nine rural counties. And, and I was a little bit lost. So the, the dentist is required to have a permit. Yes. And then you work under that permit? Is that the way it works? We, um, when, when dentists work with CRNAs in office settings only, the dentist is required to hold the permit because CRNAs are not eligible to obtain one. Okay. Um, and CRNAs currently work without any other need for permits or other types of supervision in hospitals or ambulatory surgery centers, but specifically in offices <coughs> is, is an issue. Yes, yes, Steve. I'm not quite sure how to frame this, but do CRNAs typically have privileges in hospitals? Yes, correct. So in outpatient settings where they apply their, their profession, mm -hmm. they typically have privileges in a hospital nearby? They do have privileges in both hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers, yes. Thank you. So just, just to clarify that, to make sure that I'm understanding, they have privileges for inpatient as well as outpatient anesthesia services. Is yes, that correct? Yes, correct. And we've without, a, without required medical supervision. That's correct. Thank you. And we have a significant number of providers working in offices. I understand. I just wanted to make sure that, that we understood that. Yes. Karen, that supervision um, requirement went away when? Um, for Medicare, it went away in 2009. There's actually never been a requirement in the state of California for nurse anesthetists to be supervised. Okay. So the supervision was for Medicare Part A so that facilities who um, were going to collect reimbursement had to prove that they supervised nurse anesthetists okay. to obtain the reimbursement from Medicare Part A. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you enlighten us a little bit about the the training required for CRNAs? Sure. Um, nurse anesthetists are required to have critical care nursing experience before entering their nurse anesthesia educational programs. And currently programs are 27 months to 36 months. But in 2021, 
all of the master's-based programs are going to be converted to doctoral programs. And in California, this has already happened. So they will all be at the doctoral level. Okay. Now, does the, the nursing degree need to be a baccalaureate degree? Um, in some nursing programs, yes. In, in some nurse anesthesia programs, yes. And in others, the baccalaureate degree can be basic science. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, just another, um, but just like one question regarding the education again. So you mentioned after the BSN degree, mm -hmm. the nurse will need to have some years of experience in ICU yes. setting, correct? correct? Before they can apply for the CRNA program. Correct. And how long is the CRNA program? And now that it's, go, it's moving towards doctor degree, does that mean that it's longer than it is. what it is today? Yes, it is longer. Um, programs averaged in, in the master's framework, they averaged between 85 and 100 units, which is way more than most master's degrees. And it was a logical move to, to make the programs at the doctoral level. But they will be longer. It will be at least 36 months. Okay. So just one more yes. clarification. Okay. Yeah. So you can work in, independently. I know that you mentioned no medical supervision. I'm, I'm assuming that means you That's can correct. work independently. That's correct. Your charts don't have to be signed off by, no. uh, by anyone. Okay. That's Thank correct. you. You're welcome. Dr. Chan. So I need clarification. It looks like... Um, 1646.9 is what's looked at for changing in terms of the statute, correct? Yes, I believe that's correct. So I have another question of clarification, and maybe for Stuart. 1646.1 um, describes that no dentist shall administer or order the administration of general anesthesia. And then, let's see, the fourth line down, the third line down, it says, and holds a valid general anesthesia permit issued by the board or possesses a current permit under, so forth, and holds a valid general anesthesia permit. So that is 1646.9, expands that to the physician and the nurse anesthetist are looking at that. But if we read the, the language itself, it also says that unless, well, no dentist shall order the administration of general anesthesia without a general anesthetic permit. So therefore, just based on this language, it sounds like even though our recommendation to the um, legislature for moderate sedation was to have a separate separation between surgeon, dentist, operator, and anesthesia operator, the surgeon dentist operator, if we look at that as a model, according to the first statute, says that they should hold a general anesthesia permit too, correct? That's correct. Does that happen now? You're, you're mix, if I may, through the chair, you're mixing two questions. Um, okay. First, who has the necessary <coughs> qualifications to provide general anesthesia or conscious sedation in a dental office. At this point, you have, as you rightly point, correctly pointed out, the physician uh, anesthesiologists were included under 1646.9. That was a later provision, uh, which actually, ironically, requires them to get a permit from us. Prior to that, they were just doing it without a permit. Everybody thought it was okay. Then the law changed. And there's a lot of history to that that I won't go into. The second question is, what about a separate anesthesia provider in the office of a dentist who is a non-permit holder? As long as that anesthesia provider has a permit from the board, either MD or DDS, they can do it as a separate provider. And our recommendation was not for moderate sedation, only for general anesthesia, only kids under seven. With all due respect, that's not what it says here. What it says well, here, if we can you take that order it, if you order it, then you must also have a general anesthesia permit. The language well, that, that's, yeah, if you order it, it's, that, that's true. But the, um, you only need one permit. That's not what it says here. 
Okay, well, I'll ask staff to address <clears throat> that separately. Well, uh, I think that also depends on what is the definition of ordering. Okay, I mean, if the dentist orders it, if I have a dental anesthesiologist that is a permit holder, whether that's a permit holder, whether it's a medical or a dental permit holder, he or she is the one that's ordering it, not me. Okay, so I, the dentist, is not the one that's ordering the delivery of the anesthesia. It is the permit holder that's ordering the delivery of the anesthesia. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's a nuance there, but... Right. So again, it's a yeah. definition of what is meant by ordering. Yeah. So that needs clarification. Right. Um, again, um, these statutes were written a long time ago, and there's been a lot of things that have changed in practice patterns and so on, <clears throat> that some of which are addressed in regulation, others are just kind of by force of habit and understanding of what people do, nobody really challenges it. You know, like the one year uh, provision for training in anesthesia. Those programs don't exist anymore. Right. So there's a lot of things that have been cleaned. Well, I understood. You know, again, the the old adage that a, a crisis brings up opportunities. You know, we've always obviously had a crisis, and now we have some opportunities to clean up a lot of things that probably needed to be cleaned up a long time ago, but have not come to the forefront. So some of these wording statutes as well as regulations are so old that they made sense at the time where they don't now. And, and we just haven't been able to keep up with them. So we have the opportunity now to, to rectify that. And I understand that. At the end of the day, we only have the language in front of us. Right. Yeah, Not I the agree. interpretation, but right. the language in front of us. But I think that at this point, we can bring the conversation back to the specific agenda item, which is um, talking about the certified nurse um, anesthetist. Did I hear you say that you take a national exam? Yes, correct. And so are all CRNAs created equal across yes. the United States? Correct. Yeah, it's mandatory. So if somebody was a CRNA in another state, how do they get licensed in California? They That's apply. through the nursing board. Yes, through the nursing board, Okay. which has uh, the requirements that they hold a nursing license in another state um, so they can apply by um, reciprocation that they are nationally certified and that they have graduated from an accredited program. Okay, how many programs are there in California? There are seven programs in California. Question? Yes. In order to have privileges in a hospital, just for clarification. Yes. Typically, you have so many cases that you have to bring before that hospital <coughs> to demonstrate your performance. Yes. And then you typically are proctored. Yes, correct. Does that, does that happen? That, that is correct. That's exactly Can you describe the, the typical proctoring and typical? Sure. Um, the proctoring is usually done by a member of the anesthesia department. Um, depending on the makeup of the anesthesia department, it could be an anesthesiologist or it could be a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Um, in some cases, proctoring is done by surgeons or obstetricians. Um, it's a little bit different from facility to facility, but the, that's the general process of how credentialing and privileging happens. So does, an, does JCO um, determine the number of cases you have to? Perform? Actually, no, that's no. not determined that's by JCO. Oh. Yeah. Medical, uh, medical staff. Medical staff. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? And did I hear you say this is going to be a required PhD program? Yes, it's going to be a required doctoral program. And it's not necessarily a PhD, but it would be a practice doctorate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, is that, is that doctorate requirement California or is it national? National. Okay, thank you. Last question. Yes. Last question. Um, CRNA, uh, CRNAs, do they carry their own liability insurance? Yes, we do. And is there like minimums or maximums? That there are minimums, and in a lot of cases, that's set by the state. And um, in some states, it's lower than in California. Generally, California has one million, three million. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yes. Percent. Yeah, I'm. I'm very familiar with CRNAs. They've 
back when we had them in our area, they did a lot of my maxillofacial cases, and I've worked with them off and on over the years, and they're highly skilled. They do a great job. Um, so your request is that you just be allowed to apply for one of our permits like the MDs? Yes, to be eligible to apply, mm -hmm. correct. Okay, what would you like from us? Um, if we could look at wording for legislation, um, we would be very happy to work with the dental board. Um, we could bring lots of resources and information to you, but we'd, we'd be very happy to work with you to do that. I mean, one, just a side note here, one of the laws that would have to be changed would be the Nursing Practice Act. Yes, correct. Okay, good, you're first yeah. in all that. Okay, because there's a lot of things that would have to change, but. That's uh, correct. Okay. I think the, uh, the reason the permit requirement, the requirement for the dentist to have a permit uh, presently or historically is that um, an anesthesia provider coming into an office maybe doesn't know the qualifications of the person there. If they come into an ACC or a hospital, that person will have hospital privileges to do the mm -hmm. procedures. The other thing is there isn't any provision for a dental office to have transfer arrangement with a hospital, nor is the dentist likely to be on staff at the hospital unless he's an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Most OMSs are the ones holding the permits, so there was that safeguard. Now that doesn't really pertain to the medical, the physician anesthesiologists, because you know it's just incumbent on them to be familiar and comfortable with who they're providing anesthesia for mm -hmm. and the setting in right. which they're doing it, other than they go through our evaluation process. So, I mean, yeah, okay. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Okay. Any other, yes, Brian? Um, actually, I have two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and this is something that we will talk about later, but um, there is going to be significant money coming into the state um, for children's health through the tobacco tax fund. Um, <coughs> and although <coughs> <coughs> there will be many different components of that and what it can be used for, um, how do you see that impacting what you do? <coughs> It, it, could, <coughs> it could conceivably impact what we do because we are very big providers of Medi-Cal services. So it, it could impact that. Um, but proportionally, CRNAs offer a, a large percentage of Medi-Cal services. <coughs> and for many of us, that's our focus, is to provide care for underserved communities. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. That's it. Yeah. Anybody um, else? Would like to add a little. Hello, I'm yes, Dr. Sure. Ashley. Hello, right. Dr. Witcher. It's good to see you again. <laughs> um, my faculty appointment is through University of Southern California. I am their oral and maxillofacial anesthesia education director. My degree is in educational psychology. 100% um, of the oral surgeons that have gone through USC have um, studied under me. I have um, their program down. I know CODA very well. But one of the things, I do still practice. My specialty is in trauma anesthesiology, at Los Angeles County USC Medical Center, where I still work. I am one of the three remaining ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support um, Certified Anesthesia Providers. I do an average of three to five pediatric cases per day. Because the question was raised, not to derail, but the question was raised how qualified CRNAs were to do pediatric anesthesia. Well, I can only speak for myself. One of my other colleagues is here who also does a fair amount of pediatric anesthesia. As the board knows, violence and accidents are inflicted upon children. So I personally see three to five cases per day. Our oral and maxillofacial surgeons spend uh, five months uh, on our anesthesia service. They are all under me. I'm responsible for them. They spend four months in our general OR, in our 26 OR facility, doing all types of cases. And then they go to CHLA, Children's Hospital Los Angeles, to do their pediatric rotation. Uh, I would like to see if it's within your power to change the CODA requirement for pediatric anesthesia 
it, I'm sure, Dr. Witcher, you know CODA as well as I do. And the language clearly says, well, um, it must be five months, and the, the, the fifth month should be pediatric. I would like that to say must be. I, I'm sorry, we're a little off topic right. here. It's very interesting, and I'd be happy to talk to you about this at another time, but we're, we're a little off the subject here, which has to do with the CRNAs. But thank you for that comment, and you know, it's understood. And Thank you. just one last question. Yes. Um, I don't think you said, or if you did, I was coughing. Um, <laughs> I don't think you said where um, you are with other states. Is this, the, the fact that you don't have it in California, is that unique or... It, it's a process that the state must must apply to the centers of Medi-Cal and Medi Medicaid and Medicare services. So when the states apply, it's it's granted by by CMS. So right now there's 17 other states. 17. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any other uh, of our guests that are at the table that would like to address the committee? I'm Shane. I'm from uh, UCSD, San Diego. I do CRNA there as well and do pediatric cases on a regular basis. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments or questions? Just uh, one. Ms. Carp, you gave this testimony at the, the hearing. Yes. Um, have you gone any farther seeking an author to try to change things, or were you just hoping to do that through the board, or we, did you we, have a... We have not sought an author at okay. this point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your information and Thank for you. attending our meeting. And uh, I'm sure we'll here. be in touch in the future. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from members of the <clears throat> public that have not addressed this issue at this point? <clears throat> uh, just make sure your microphone is turned on, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Seibert, representing CSA. Um, first of all, we uh, testified at the Senate board hearing that we are in support of all qualified anesthesia providers being able to provide anesthesia services for children. The other point that I think um, may need to be clarified for the board as well as the public is that both physician anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists can go into an oral surgeon's office or into the office of a dentist who has a general anesthesia permit without their own permit. There's no impediment there. As, you, as Dr. Morrow pointed out a little while ago, only one permit is needed. So the general anesthesia permit is only a barrier to a physician anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist going to deliver services in a dentist's office who does not currently have a general anesthesia permit. So for the vast majority of the oral surgeons and the dentists who already have general anesthesia permits, all you have to do is have the dentist or the oral surgeon request the service. There's no other barrier. That's why I think that access to care argument needs to, needs to be very clear to everyone. It's a matter of if you want the service, the service can be had without a permit. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments or questions? Okay. All right, moving on then to uh, agenda item number six. Uh, this is any public comments on items not on the agenda for consideration for future uh, agendized meetings. Okay, with nothing said, we'll go on to seven future agenda items, stakeholders. Any uh, encouraged uh, stakeholders to uh, possibly present any uh, items for future agenda? Okay, <clears throat> with that said, going on to number eight, any committee members uh, that have comments or items to be placed on the agenda for future meetings? Yes. Do you, as committee chair, have an idea where you would, what you would like the committee to take up next? What I would like to take on next? Uh, first of all, I think we obviously need to be, have our ears to 
to the ground as far as where legislation is going with, uh, uh, as a result of the Senate hearing on the 13th of, of this month. Uh, we need to be actively involved in the development, I think, of the form, which is needed to be in compliance with 2235, AB 2235, uh, which is obviously going to be taken care of as an interim right now by our board staff, but then we need to go through that uh, regulatory process to develop that form. Uh, and. Uh, Obviously, continued discussion regarding, uh, you know, where where we feel comfortable going with the uh, addition of, of the nurse anesthetist uh, model to our uh, <clears throat> providers as far as uh, uh, general anesthesia providers for dentists in their offices as needed. Uh, there seems to be some changes that need to be made in current uh, legislation that will allow more freedom of, of that happening, which I think is, is legitimate. Uh, again, it's, it's updating, uh, <clears throat> I shouldn't say antiquated, but previously developed codes and regulations that met the need at the time, but are, are not meeting the need at the present time. So that's a, that's a review process that we need to look at. Okay. So Thank you. That's a, off, off the top of my head on the spur of the moment, okay? Any other questions before, or any comments from committee members before we adjourn the committee meeting? Okay, thank you all for being willing to do a maiden voyage with the committee. So uh, <clears throat> I'm learning as much as the rest of you are, so we'll, uh, we'll learn together, okay? Moving forward, we're adjourned. <clears throat>